one way to think about the complex three-dimensional structure of a protein is as a sequence of dihedral angles between different bonds within the polypeptide backbone. And this actually isn't as complicated as it sounds because there is restricted rotation about the CN bond in the amide. The practical implication of this is that the carbonyl group, the amide NH, and the alpha carbon are all coplanar. In this diagram of a polypeptide below, this means that we can use the alpha carbon, the nitrogen, the attached hydrogen, and the carbonyl group to define a plane. All of the atoms highlighted in red and all of the bonds are in a common plane. The same is true for the corresponding atoms in the next residue, which I'm going to highlight in yellow. These atoms highlighted in yellow are coplanar with each other. Really, the only two dihedral angles that matter to the conformation of these two residues are the dihedral angles associated with bonds between the alpha carbon and the adjacent carbonyl carbon and nitrogen. These bonds are the only ones that can rotate freely along the polypeptide backbone. And in theory anyway, at least naively, we can expect any combination of angles here to produce any potential shape between these two residues. In practice, however, some dihedral angle combinations are inaccessible or rare due to severe steric clashes that would result, for example, involving the side chain or involving the carbonyl groups with one another. The two dihedral angles that we use to describe the conformation of a polypeptide chain are called phi and psi. Psi, which I'll highlight in blue, corresponds to the dihedral angle associated with the bond between the carbonyl carbon and the alpha carbon. And phi corresponds to the dihedral angle associated with rotation about the alpha carbon nitrogen bond. In a sense, we can compress the conformation of this particular residue whose alpha carbon is right here, into a single pair of numbers, phi and psi, that define the relative positions of the planes of the red and yellow atoms. And in doing that, for the full set of residues in a polypeptide, in other words, in getting a full set of phi and psi values for all of the residues in a polypeptide chain, we can generate a graph with a large number of points. Each point on this graph corresponds to an amino acid residue in the polypeptide chain. And notice that we have on one axis the phi values, those are on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have the psi values. This type of plot, which is a graphical representation of the three-dimensional shape or conformation of a protein, is called a Ramachandran plot. And these angles, phi and psi, are referred to as Ramachandran angles. We alluded to this earlier, but it's worth pointing out again that there are certain regions of the Ramachandran plot where points tend to cluster. For example, we can see one right here with a large number of points in a common region of the Ramachandran plot. This occurs because these regions are associated with the secondary structural elements that we've seen previously, alpha helices and beta sheets, and the residues involved in those secondary structures are going to have similar values for the Ramachandran angles. This particular Ramachandran plot was generated from a crystal structure of barley alpha amylase, an enzyme in barley that breaks bonds in starches, polysaccharides, to form small disaccharides and monosaccharides. So far we've discussed primary and secondary structure, and we've learned how to encode the three-dimensional conformational structure of a protein as a graph using the Ramachandran plot. The next level up involves combining the secondary structures into recurring elements called tertiary structures. And these are more commonly known as domains, although the term tertiary structure is commonly used to refer collectively to these higher order collections of alpha helices and beta sheets. Although we can imagine arranging helices and sheets in a huge variety of ways, a small number of patterns are observed in nature. And we can account for about 90% of observed protein domains as one of the following. The first class are essentially all alpha domains. And then the death effector domain, whose structure we see right here, it's clear why this is called all alpha. This is all alpha helices clustered together like this. There are a number of different types of alpha domains that differ in how the helices are clustered together, but their key feature is that they include only alpha helices. In the enzyme pyruvate kinase, we see the other two types. 
first in blue, we have a beta domain, a domain that consists mostly of beta sheets with a few unstructured regions where the strands wrap around. We also have in this enzyme mixed alpha-beta domains where alpha helices and beta sheets come together to form higher level structures. And here again, with the beta and alpha-beta domains, there are specific examples of how these secondary structures combine to form specific domains. And these have various names like the barrel, the beta barrel, so on and so forth. We won't go through the details here. I just wanted to present this high level classification of tertiary structures based on the nature of the secondary structures involved in the domains. Finally, it's also worth mentioning that a good portion of a lot of proteins involves unstructured or loop regions. These tend to be more conformationally flexible, they're mobile, and they can give rise to significant conformational changes in proteins where we tend to find the alpha and beta domains are more rigid and are less susceptible to conformational changes. Just to highlight one example of a specific domain, I wanted to take a look at the TIM barrel. The TIM barrel domain is named for the triose phosphate isomerase enzyme which is important in glycolysis and is found in a huge variety of organisms. But this TIM barrel structure with a barrel-like structure of beta sheets or beta strands surrounded by alpha helices is found in a number of different enzymes and interestingly often involves a variety of different amino acid sequences. It's not really associated with a conserved primary sequence of amino acids. So here we see it in an aldolase enzyme, I've circled kind of the inner area of the barrel, which is often the site of catalytic reactivity. And here we see the TIM barrel showing up in pyruvate kinase right about here. And this drawing makes it clear that an inner barrel is surrounded by alpha helical secondary structures for, to form the TIM barrel. One of the nice things about domains, and we've kind of highlighted this here, is that they're sites of substrate binding and catalytic reactivity tend to be conserved as well. So we can look at it, for example, a tin barrel domain and expect that catalysis is going to, to occur on one end or the other of the barrel.